Sobriety is weird, never predictable, never linear. Non-addicts and people who've never been close to someone in active addiction have this misconception that once you reach sobriety, then that's it. Like, congratulations, you're fixed now, as if the drugs were what was causing the problem in the first place. A lot of people don't realize that drugs sex, alcohol, those things are usually only the secondary problem. Recovery is a long and arduous process, and a lot of what goes into it isn't widely known or understood. So I'm here to break it down and walk you through the common experience, so that maybe you or someone else can understand why it's not as simple as just quitting cold turkey. But before we continue, let's hear from today's sponsor. Today's sponsor is Skillshare. Skillshare is an online community for those of us who love to learn at any level. Skillshare is a huge collective of tens and thousands of different classes for every different genre of creative learning. You can check out everything from music to photography, web design, and my personal favorites, fine art and illustration. Being a busy mom, I really don't have a lot of spare time, but that doesn't mean I have to sacrifice my creativity and desire to learn. Thankfully, most of Skillshare's classes are under 60 minutes and packed full of useful tools to help me get started on a new skill. What's also really great is their classes are affordable, much more inexpensive than any in-person option. More interior design this month with the course Interior Design. Create a plan for your perfect room by Arlen Hernandez. I'm currently setting up a new studio space again, and let me tell you, this space needs some help. Arlen walks you through how to visualize your space by using Photoshop to design and mood boards to envision. It's one of the shorter classes that I've taken, but I feel I learned a lot about the basic aspects of design. The first 1,000 people to click the link in the description will get one month of Skillshare Premium for free. Come and start your creative journey today. Explore with Skillshare. For a lot of us addicts, we get drawn back into our addiction because the underlying problem was never treated. Sure, you can get sober without doing any work on your mental health, but for a lot of us, it's a hollow victory that doesn't end up lasting long. That's why the majority of rehabilitation programs not only have a detox center, but also an inpatient program that you go to after the drugs are out of your system. This is where you do a lot of the accepting of the things you cannot change and saying, hi, my name is Emily and I'm an addict, etc. Etc. And for most addicts, the work doesn't just stop once they graduate the program. A lot of us will continue on into AA or NA or an additional outpatient program. They really mean it when they say it works if you work it. Now, I have some personal criticisms of Alcoholics Anonymous as an institution, but I also realize that AA has kept millions of people sober and off the streets, so I'll hold those personal criticisms for some other time. The point is, there is a tremendous amount of aftercare with sobriety, and even I was a bit dismissed of that fact at first, hence why I relapsed quite a few times and didn't tell anyone. I was embarrassed and ashamed, especially because a lot of these people who thought I was sober were under the impression I was starting to get my life together. What could I do? Call them up and give them a fun little update on how I dropped the ball again because I got triggered by that scene in Pulp Fiction where there are a ton of gratuitous close-up shots of Vince Vega prepping his shot? I love that movie, but I still, to this day, have to skip that scene because it's such a major trigger gives me like full body shivers and everything. Just no bueno. And when I say trigger in this context, I mean it triggers a craving. I think when a lot of people hear the word trigger in today's context, they only think of something triggering a trauma response, which can also happen when recovering addicts experience things that remind them of their addiction. Sometimes something as simple as a smell or sound can trigger both a craving and a trauma response. Regardless, it's important to remember that there are many different types of triggers, all of which can result in different bodily responses. For addicts, when the word trigger is used, it's most often in reference to a craving. I just wanted to go ahead and clarify that so people were not confused. The first time I got sober, it only lasted a few weeks, and in those short few weeks, all my mind could think about was how bad I wanted to use. It was like everything else in my life was meaningless. My head was so abuzz with desire for my toxin of choice, any toxin at all, really, that the whole world was all a blur around me. Nothing else mattered. I stopped hearing the words that came from the people around me. It was like they were the adults from the Peanuts cartoon, just lots of indecipherable sounds. I was too incensed by the main character of my story at the time, which, and this might shock some of you, was not me, myself, and I. It was my toxin of choice. Why do you think they call it him? 
heroin because it makes you feel heroic. Actually, it makes you feel incredible and then turns your brain into a limp noodle floating around in stupid soup, but you know, tomato, tomato. That first attempt at sobriety was like jumping into a freezing lake. I knew it was cold, but I jumped in unprepared anyway. Consequences be damned. So I guess I wasn't too surprised when I couldn't handle the freezing temperatures and had to get out and search for warmth. After that first cold turkey catastrophe, I realized I had two options for my next attempt. I could try and better train myself for the freezing water, which pfft, why would I do that? I'm totally fine. I'm not the problem. I don't need fixing. Or find a way to somehow modify the entire lake and make it suitable for my comfort level. Yeah, I picked that one. That sounds doable. An entire fucking lake. How hard could it be? Second attempt. I created a laundry list of rules for myself. It went as follows. So obviously, I will quit H and Crystal flat out. H was my toxin of choice and Crystal was just too hard on my body. Easy. They're out. I'll allow myself to do blow, but only one night a month and I can only snort it. No mainlining, no crack, only powder. It's so much more mundane that way, obviously. I can do Molly, but only on the weekends. And I don't think I need to go on. You can probably guess how well that all worked out. So modifying the whole f***ing metaphorical lake to fit my comfort levels was simply not doable. The lake is cold. It will never not be cold. I cannot change the lake. After my second sobriety soured, I gave up even thinking about conquering the lake for a period of time. I just existed for a while, taking anything to numb the pain or to feel a shred of happiness or to prescribe meaning where there was none before in order to distract myself. Basically, I took anything to get any joyful synapses firing at all because at that point, my brain could no longer do that on its own without chemical intervention. I had lost a lot of my support network at that point because the people within it were tired of being let down. I don't blame them for stepping back. They set a firm and healthy boundary, which is something that's really important to do when you are close with an addict. In fact, boundaries not only protect the person setting them, but also the person who is in active addiction. I can't stress enough how important they are. If you're in a situation where you feel guilt for drawing a line in the sand, I want you to know that you're doing the right thing. Everyone deserves to feel safe and respected, and don't let anyone try and Jedi mind trick you into believing you deserve any less or that you're somehow to blame for someone using or relapsing. You choose who you let in and out of your life, and if someone continues to serve you a big steaming platter of pain, then you have every right to terminate the relationship. Whether that be permanently or temporarily is up to you. And any addicts who are listening and feel hurt or angry by being cut off, you need to understand that as well and respect the boundary that's been drawn. There's a tendency to fall into codependent friendships and relationships during active addiction, and honestly, it's just one more thing keeping you from getting on the right path. Dwelling and stewing on these personal relationships will only further complicate your recovery. You need to accept what is and emotionally release that person back into the universe. Being an addict is quite literally classified as a brain disease. It's not this edgy piece Piece of jewelry we can take on and off at will. There will always be craving, there will always be a tendency to overdo things, there will always be that understanding that we have the special brain that doesn't know when to quit. But there will also always be choice. Yes, we are at that part of the video. Let me make this as clear as I can. Being an addict is not a choice, but your personal decisions are. What that means is that you're the one who needs to make the right decisions to put yourself on a better path. The being an addict part will try and interfere with those decisions because when you're in active addiction, you will always want your toxin over what's best for you. That's just how it goes. But I urge you to start making healthier decisions in smaller doses to start. Like I said earlier, just deciding to go cold turkey without resolving any of the underlying issues usually doesn't end well. You need to start the ball rolling with smaller, daily good decisions. Warm yourself up to the idea of choosing one or two things over your toxin. Build your mental strength because ultimately that is what is going to get you into a proper state of recovery, one where you're finding peace, balance, and contentment. You can't just blame the fact that you're an addict on your bad decisions and use it as a pass to not do the work or to avoid taking accountability. And honestly, in a lot of cases, there is no right way of making it better. The closest way to make it better is to make sure it never happens again. To do right by your community, by the people you've hurt, and to do right by yourself. You deserve to come out the other side, and you deserve to be proud of the person that you are. But it takes a lot of work, a lot of mental discipline,
self-discipline, and it starts small, and that's okay, as long as it starts somewhere. Thank you guys so much for watching, and don't forget to stay out of trouble. See you guys later.